Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. This might be a control issue, but I have to have my space the way I want it. (laughs) We'll talk about that. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. I just love this weekend. It's such a privilege to be up here and talking with all of you. My name is Elaine Thomas, and I'm an incredibly grateful member of Al-Anon. Wow, I really didn't think I'd get a little choked up, but <clears throat> but you all understand, so I don't have to worry about it in here. And I definitely hope to be here for life. My home group is the Barbadan AFG. Without Al-Anon and the changed attitudes that are a result of my work in my Al-Anon program of recovery, I would still be a fearful, angry, resentful, and many other negative words type of person. My entire life, I have needed to be in control. I grew up with alcoholism. I needed to be in control. I needed that to be safe. Everything was black and white. There were no shades of gray. I married alcoholism. I needed to continue to be in control. (laughs) My addiction is control. I learned in the program that it was fear that was under my need to be in control. Always afraid something was going to go wrong. Always waiting for something to go wrong. I had to realize I didn't cause it. I can't cure it. And I can't control it. And the it is alcoholism. The three C's led to a changed attitude. The acceptance of the three C's led to a changed attitude. Changing my attitude helped me to accept my powerlessness. My life was certainly unmanageable. I remember when my husband first became sober and got into his program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's at that time that I came to Al-Anon, which was seven years ago, and we decided at that time we would go to a marriage counselor. Well, for years I wanted to go to a marriage counselor, but he kept (laughs) saying no, and I could never understand why. Well, denial was alive and kicking in those days. Anyway, so the counselor told me I was sick, and I left that meeting furious. What in the world is she talking about? I'm not the sick one. He's the sick one. We're never going back. Let's get out of here as fast as we possibly can. Then, of course, I realized I was the sick one as well. And upon that realization, that's when healing and recovery began. I was crazy and insane. I came to realize that over time, a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I've always had trust issues. I'd go to meetings, but there was no way I'm talking to any of you. I can't trust any of you. As I began to let go, turn my life, my will, over to a power greater than myself, whom I choose to call God, I began to let go of the fear of trusting others. I began to let go of the fear of trusting all of you. I learned to talk at meetings. I learned to share my feelings. Recovery began. And it, healing began, and it continues every single day. Talking at meetings helps me with my own recovery. Helps others with their recovery as I share my experience, strength, and hope. Allowing my faith and spirituality to deepen allowed me to let go and begin to trust each and every day. Turning my life and will over to God has been one of the most important changed attitudes in my recovery. As I learned that it was fear underneath the need to be in control, as I realized that the more I fought for control, the more angry, anxious, and full of fear I became. I would live each and every day in fear. My goal then became minute by minute, day by day, hour by hour, to let go 
and surrender my will to God. I've always felt the fear in my gut. Prayer and acceptance means that I don't need to do that any longer. I can let go of the churning in my gut. I can surrender to God and know that peace and serenity will come and that churning will go away. When I let go of what I moved moved into, marriage with alcoholism, but prior to that, growing up with the alcoholism, my family of origin wasn't the family I wanted them to be. I wanted the white picket fence. Some days I still do. You know, it was the progress, not perfection program. Still working on that. You know, my escape when I was young was reading. I read the Brady Bunch. You know, the Bobsy Twins, Nancy True. And those of you my age will remember those. They were happy families. I wanted one of those. <laughs> but the more I fought it, the more, again, my life was filled with anxiety and cravings for more, more outside myself, money, family, friends, things, happiness. The more I did that, the more I turned to my own will, the more unhappy and anxious and resentful I was. Turning my will and my life over to God has allowed me to let go of the fear, consciously and at times even subconsciously. It has allowed me to let go of the feeling that something is going to happen, always waiting, even when you're feeling really good, that something is going to happen. Once I let go of that, what an amazing feeling to know, wow, I can feel really good right now and not expect anything to happen because most likely nothing is going to happen. And that's a wonderful place to be. To trust to know that God will provide for all of my needs allows me to be peaceful and to be full of serenity. Changing to an attitude of acceptance has been another incredible change for me. It's been a journey of the three A's, awareness, acceptance, and action. There have been areas in my life where I've had to dig deeply into myself and become aware of the issues behind my behavior. I have been on a journey of discovery of who I am, the very good, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I have come to accept who I was and who I am, knowing I was this way because I grew up with alcoholism. My character defects were coping mechanisms. They helped me live with alcoholism. They helped me stay safe. They helped me when I married alcoholism. I'm a firm believer that there is something behind every one of my character defects. As I took the time to explore and go beneath the surface, I was able to understand and see why I behaved the way I did. This was the awareness. Understanding and accepting why I did what I did allowed me to let go of the negative defects and more fully develop the positive characteristics that are so much a part of me, who I am, and who God wants me to be. The action was to let go and accept who I am and that by surrendering to God's will, I can be the best person I can be. I can only do this with God's help. I can't do this alone. I often find myself working the three A's today. When something in my life causes me distress, I have to stop and become aware what's underneath the feeling, what's causing it. Once I'm aware, I can accept whatever it might be, and I know the action is always to surrender to God's will. I have come to fully realize that the only way to peace and serenity is to believe that happiness is an inside job. I can no longer look outside myself for happiness. I must be content with who I am and where I am. God has a plan for me. God has put me exactly where I am. Trying to change this only leads to discontent and unhappiness. 
I have learned to accept that I have allowed myself to be a victim. I wanted you to pity me. I have now learned that I know what's underneath that need for pity for others and my need to be a victim, and I have been able to let go of that. <clears throat> With letting go of that need, I have become so much more healthy. I am able to go to the positive. I am able to see the positive in situations, count my blessings, and have an attitude of gratitude. The attitude of gratitude allows me to let go of expectations, for the most part. Let's be realistic here, right? <laughs> it allows me to release the resentful thinking that is a result of unfulfilled expectations. As I become aware that I am having expectations that are not going to be fulfilled, I realize this is going to lead me to resentful thinking. When this is happening, I try to consciously stop myself, see what's positive in the situation, think about the positives, count my blessings. This helps me to release me from my expectations and release me from my resentful thinking. <clears throat> Accepting who I am and beginning to love myself has been one of the most incredible changes of this program. I can't love others if I don't love myself. Learning to trust in this program has been another wonderful journey of change. Knowing I could talk to my sponsor about any and everything, not be judged, has helped me more fully develop my trust in others. Sharing my defects with my sponsor and God has freed me to grow into the person God wants me to be. Developing a stronger faith relationship with God has been wonderful. Knowing that I can talk to God about everything, that he's my best friend, that I can go to him at any time of the day or night, my faith relationship has strengthened enormously. And I know that I can surrender to God's will and let go of my own will. Each and every day I begin with prayer. It's harder now. I have a three-year-old. I have older kids, too. They're 26, 22, and 21. And now we have a three-year-old. So, you know, that interim time, yeah, you can wake up and do the prayer thing really easily. Now it's not so easily, but easy. But nevertheless, I just try to get up earlier. Or, you know, say, this mommy's pray time and get interrupted every 30 seconds. Nevertheless, I still try to start my day with prayer and throughout the day consciously bring God into my being. Sometimes it's subconscious, but for me I have to physically think, stop, and become aware of God and bring him into my being. I know God loves me unconditionally. He has told me I am his beloved daughter. I was made in his image and likeness. There is nothing about me that I should not love. God loves me and loves me unconditionally. God forgives me for all of my past mistakes and all of my daily mistakes. All I have to do is ask. <clears throat> there have been others I have hurt. Knowing this has helped me to make amends. Continuing to take daily inventory, making amends if necessary, continuing to pray every day and meditate with my God, to live God's will and not mine, and to take the Al-Anon message of recover to others. This is my daily prayer. It's my daily goal. Early in sobriety, early when I came into Al-Anon, I had a close friend say, you're not going to put one of those easy does it <laughs> one day at a time bumper stickers on your bumper, are you? And I said, well, of course not. A, I hate bumper stickers. Well, I hated bumper stickers because my dad was a bumper sticker person. And they were everywhere, every single car. So he cured me of bumper stickers. Nevertheless, I would put an easy does it, a one day at a time, you name the slogan bumper sticker on my car, every single one of them, because if that would bring someone else to ask me, what do you mean by that? What does that mean? How do you use that? And if that would allow them to get Al-Anon's message of recovery, I am all for it. 
Early in the program, early in the program, I asked someone why they kept coming back. I thought it was crazy. You know, these people are here for 20 years, 25, 30 years. I know now the answer is because it works. I never want to lose it. I always want to work my program of recovery, share my experience, strength, and hope with others. I want to go to meetings. I want to read my conference-approved literature. I want to use the slogans. I want to work the steps. I want to talk to other Al-Anon members. I want everyone to have the peace and serenity that I have gained in this wonderful program. I am fully aware Al-Anon not only works with alcoholism, but it works in every aspect of my life. My plan is to keep coming back. Thank you. We're going to have our next speaker in the, the lectern. There's a problem with it. It's a little too high. It's not that Pat is short. So. <laughs> Just make it be too high. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Pat, and I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon, and my recovery has been for about 12 years now. And, uh, hi, everyone. Um, if you would just help me for a moment to start with the serenity prayer so I can calm down inside. <laughs> God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Um, I think God is very creative. I looked at this topic totally different. And so my, my little talk's going to be different than Eileen's, and I think that's what God wants us to hear today. Um, I'm short, and if you didn't notice, they put me on about an eight-inch... Uh, riser here. <laughs> Anyhow, and they, I've always heard that short people have attitudes. <laughs> and, 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 and that's because there's this large person inside us that wants out. And, and Al-Anon's teaching me how to get that person out of here, you know, that he's not quite so mm, cocky or mouthy and all those good things. Um, Changed attitudes, a recovery. I heard that one the first meeting I came to. And I thought, well, yeah, I have attitudes. Doesn't everyone? And I thought, and I wouldn't have some of the attitudes I have if I didn't have an alcoholic. If he didn't behave that way, I wouldn't react this way. If he didn't say that to me, I wouldn't say that to him. So why do I have to change? Why is it my problem? You know, it's his fault. He's out there drinking and doing what I don't want him to do. I was very good at rolling my eyes, and I could make a real stature attitude for you, and everybody knew what they were because they were very profound. And my words and my reflections gave off the attitude of anger. And I was a very angry person, and I... uh Sometimes you forget how you behaved. Like after you've been in the program a little bit, you kind of forget how you were like maybe 10 years prior to that or five years prior to that. And I, a member of our one meeting came to me one day and she said, you were so angry all the time. I knew you. And I thought, well, who are you to come up to me and say that? I really felt that way. Well, that young lady had worked with my daughter, and so she saw me a lot, and she saw those attitudes and that anger that was underlying. And that was like a real wake-up call to me that I needed to really begin to look at me and see what was going on with me. My attitudes had become my defense. I could defend myself with an attitude. And the thing, the problem with that was if I copped an attitude, so did the next person. And if they got loud, I got a little louder. And if they uh, pushed a little hard, I pushed a little harder. And I was very um, ugly at times. And that's the only word there is for it. When I came here, you told me that I needed to not look at that alcoholic, that I needed to look at me. And that I was choosing to be this way. And I thought, what do you mean I'm choosing to be this way? I don't like being this way. 
but that's how I have to be. And you said, no. No, you're still choosing to be this way. Yesterday's reading from Courage to Change began how easy it can be to justify our own unacceptable behavior. Perhaps we excuse ourselves claiming that we provoked, we were provoked or had no choice. Or we dismiss our actions by telling others that everyone does the same thing. With these and other justifications, we pretend that our wrongs don't count. And you know, our wrongs do count. And this is denial, and this denial must be overcome when we work our fourth step. So, oh my, eye-openers, you know, I did have bad behaviors, and I was not nice to be around all the time, and now I needed to do something about that. As I began working on my attitudes, I found that my attitudes were a lot like my body fat. They got latched on there, and they stayed, and they got very, very comfortable, and they got very, very comfortable. Well, right fighting body fat, you have to do some work. You have to start changing a few things. And I will, if you want to lose weight, you diet and you exercise. Well, and I noticed with weight, and you probably know this too because you're all old enough to know a little bit about gaining weight, it's a lot easier to put on than it is to take off. <clears throat> well, I found this true of my attitudes as well. My attitudes were like, they liked where they were and I liked them. And they wanted to stay. They latched on to me, and they just kind of made it really um, very effective in myself, I thought. <clears throat> Changing my attitudes toward my alcoholic and other members of my family was a lot of work. It was work on my part, because I had to become aware of what I was saying and doing and why I did those things. Not just that I did them, but why was I doing them? Creating a gratitude list really helped me to begin to change my negative thinking into positive thinking. I found that there were many positive things about my son. He was loving and caring and had a great attitude toward people. That became evident to me. People loved my son. He was kind and courteous and caring and loving. Why had I stopped seeing these great qualities in him? What had happened that I no longer saw him as that young child that I had raised and, and loved? But other people could still see those things in him, and I couldn't. I didn't understand that alcoholism was a disease. I do now. But that was a real hard thing for me to change, to de decide that it wasn't his choice, but that he had a disease. That was the beginning of my changed attitudes. Have you ever seen someone walk in the room and right away you roll your eyes? Or you, pop an, you grab an attitude before anything is said or done? Just because it's that person? Well, I did that a lot. <laughs> and I found that most of the time it was because I had no control over that person. I had no control over them because I couldn't, couldn't make them say what I wanted them to say or dress the way I wanted them to dress or do what I wanted them to do. And that's when step one said to me, aha, you're powerless. And I said, yes, I am. For some reason, I took all that personally. And I thought that all reflected on me. And so I had to tell you, don't do that. You embarrass me when you do that. And all those wonderful things that we say. And then I had to ask myself, when did I become so important? <laughs> <laughs> And why did I think I was so powerful? That ugly defect of mine called arrogance kind of got in the way. And I had to learn that I was arrogant. I didn't think I was, but you taught me that I was. Changing an attitude for me began when I <clears throat> saw that I was the one with the unhealthy attitudes. That it was me. And that was hard. That was really hard to look at myself and see how ugly I had become. Mm. Courage to Change on page 105. Today's reminder said, Today I'm going to pay close attention to what I tell myself. 
If necessary, I'll stop in mid-thought, start over, and replace negative illusions with positive truths. And from all of our affairs, right under that, it says, what we teach ourselves in thoughts and attitudes is up to us. And it told me that my stinking thinking had to leave. I had to replace that stinking thinking with some positive things. And so begin to not look at the negative things and the people that I love and the people I have contact with. But I needed to start to look for the positive things in them. A beautiful smile. Somebody who's happy. Someone who dresses well. Even anything simple. Someone who always has something kind to say. And not look at the negatives. You know, we all have negative things. We all have things that we don't like about ourselves. And um, sometimes we try to cover them up so that other people don't see them. But you know, we only fool ourselves. That too is an illusion. People know who we are. And they see us for who we are. My alcoholic isn't really interested in my struggle with his disease. You know, he just there really isn't. Nor did he understand that my attitudes were a poison within me that caused that ugliness that he saw. And those, that poison made me so miserable and so unhappy that why would he even want to listen to me? I mean, you don't want to listen to somebody that's always demeaning you and talking down to you and making you feel bad. You don't want that. They, and my alcoholic didn't either. As I began to identify my attitudes, I caught myself before I'd roll my eyes or make my stand and all the little ugly comments that I made. I needed to stop and regroup my thoughts. I asked God to help me to restore positive thinking in my daily life. I saw that instead of encouraging my family, I was dragging them down into the depths of alcoholism right along with me because I had the isms and I had them really bad. I learned that my attitudes are catchy. If I cop one, my children are very good at copying them right back. <laughs> and my husband can kind of just ignore me. That's, that's his way of coping with me. He just kind of ignores me. Okay, go do your thing, Pat, whatever that might be. I'll be happy here, you be happy over there. And that's the way it goes. <laughs> um, when I use sarcasm, and sarcasm in our world is very common, and um, it just seems to be part of everyday conversation. But I found that sarcasm is like plywood. And if you've ever worked with plywood, you will totally understand this. As you pull it apart, it splinters. And it can't be restored like it was. It's splintered. And that's what I was doing when I used sarcasm in my family. I was split, splintering my family. And it, it breaks my heart now to think about the things that I said that really caused pain in my family. And it's hard. It's really hard to go to them and say, I'm really sorry I behaved that way. And they say, oh, Mom, it's okay. You just, it's okay. We were bad. We were really bad. <laughs> I said, no, I have to be responsible for what I did. And what I did was wrong. And, and they, they still go, ah, we were really bad. And at times they were, <laughs> but that still didn't give me the right to do what I did. And so, and I, and I, I do, I do know them. My attitudes can be positive and healthy, healthy and encouraging, or they can be negative, destructive, and demeaning. And that is entirely up to me. It's what I choose, not what they choose. It is what I choose. I love my alcoholic. I love him more today than I thought I ever could, because there was a time when I didn't know that I loved my alcoholic. I questioned whether I loved my alcoholic. Things were really bad. I care where he goes, and I care what he does. And inside, I just really, really care about my son. My son is 46 years old, and he is slowly dying from the disease of alcoholism. And I know that. I sometimes plead with God to keep him safe. I sometimes plead with God to not make him suffer long. Because the disease is truly taking him.
I don't know why his drinking bothered me so bad. I had an alcoholic grandfather, but I didn't know it was alcoholism. I just thought he was a happy guy. And uh, <clears throat> as long as he didn't drink too much, he was a lot of fun. But he would get mean after he got really drunk. And um, we just stayed away from him. So, you know, I just didn't realize. But my son's alcoholism bothered me so bad because his natural mother passed away from alcoholism and drugs. And um, I was so afraid of that for him. So I was angry because he was drinking, because he knew how his mom had passed. So I was angry about that. And so my attitudes were really like, you can't do this. I won't let you do this. And he's like, ha, 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 I can do whatever I want. And he has. And he has. You told me I had no control over what he did or where he went or how much he drank. And um, I finally learned that, probably about three, four years into the program. I finally said, okay, you're right. I can't, I can't, I can no longer fight this anymore. You told me to stop looking at my alcoholic and look at me. Don't worry, don't worry about your alcoholic, because he has a higher power just like you have a higher power, and your, his higher power will take care of him. And your higher power is going to help you get healthy if you start looking at yourself. And so that's what I had to do. Um, Al-Anon taught me that my recovery is my responsibility and no one else. No one can recover for me, and I can't recover for anyone else. I can only recover for myself. He told me that Al-Anon will work for me if I allow it to. And that this program is not about the alcoholic. It is about us. about me. <clears throat> Hope for today, page 45, which is February 14th, the thought for the day said, Al-Anon meetings teach me and allow me to experience and to practice firsthand the tools that transform communication barriers into bridges. I had communication barriers. Big time. Real, really listening meant being open to others, being free of my own attitudes. And being released and being free. And Mickey, my friend, always says, free. You know, you're free. And that is that is so true. The program does free us from, it frees us from ourselves. So we can be ourselves because of who we become. Prayer and meditation in step 11 encourages me to com- have an open communication with my higher power. And I needed that. And I I always had believed in God, and I always went to church, and I always did things. But I never felt that I could ever measure up to what God wanted me to be. And the program taught me that God loves me right where I am, accepts me right where I am. And he knows all my attitudes, and he's working on some of them for me. Because some of them are still very comfortable for me. I have a lot of good attitudes, and I have a lot of... I'm a, basically a very happy person, but there are days when I am mean and ugly. And um, God's working on that for me so that I can start over right now. I don't have to wait for tomorrow morning to start over. I can start over right now. And he reminds me of that daily, when I, especially if I'm frustrated. Um, I came to understand that my son was not out to destroy me, which is what I thought he was, to hurt me or make me unhappy. I had to stop taking everything so personally. Today, I can hold my son, and I can hug him, and I can tell him I understand. You taught me not to lay guilt on him, because he carries enough guilt already. And he hurts. He hurts in ways I don't understand. I needed to love him. I didn't need to lay my attitudes on him. And that, you've taught me that. Um, today, when I hold him, he was, he doesn't come home very often anymore, but one time when he came home, right after I finally got it, um, he had been sober for about a month, and he went with some friends, and he came back, and he was soused. And um, he went to the front porch, and he sat down, and I went out, and I sat down beside him, put my arm around him, and I said, it's okay. You can always start over. I would have never done that before. But I could tell him it was okay. I didn't lay guilt on him. 
I didn't make him feel shameful for what had happened. I had told him it was okay. I had finally gotten it. I finally understood it was a disease. I finally understood that he was powerless over this disease because of where he is in the disease. And that was hard. But I was so grateful that God gave me that opportunity. Like that body fat I talked about earlier. (laughs) Once I've lost a few pounds, my clothes don't fit so good. And that's what happens when I change my attitudes. Those old attitudes don't fit anymore. Those old attitudes don't feel comfortable anymore. And I know right away when I slip into them. It's like putting on a a size 14 pair of pants and you wear a 10 now. They just don't fit. And that's, that's what happens when we work our steps, our programs. We talk to our sponsors. We go to meetings. We go to conferences. We begin to get better. And I have begun to get so much better. And I feel so much better about myself. The slogans really helped me in making positive thoughts come into my mind. Let go and let God. He's really in control anyhow. So that's a good thing. And then live and let live. Think. Easy does it. Just for today, let it begin with me. Turn my negative thinking into positive thinking. And helps me to stay on track. When I'm frustrated is when I start copying attitudes again, and that's when I have to stop right away and thinking, okay, what's going on with me? Why is this bothering me so badly? Working with my negative feelings and attitudes through the steps helps me to know where I am and what's going on. I know I need to start reworking a gratitude list and to begin looking for positive and good things in the people around me when I start when I start back up again. Having healthy attitudes makes minding my own business so much easier because live and let live taught me that I don't want you to tell me what to do any more than you want me to tell you what to do. I don't want that. And happiness is the inside job. Changed attitudes make happiness a daily experience if I so choose. And thank you very much. Now we'll have our final panelist. After that, we'll have comments, questions, things like that. Then we'll have the closing and the Lord's Prayer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Phil B., and I'm a grateful recovering al I'm grateful to be part of this panel and part of this 79th anniversary of AA's founding. And Jeff, thank you for this topic. Uh, I was glad we read a second preamble so everybody remembered where it came from. Uh, It's one of those things you keep hearing but never always uh, remember what the source is. But uh, it is in one of the preambles to the 12 steps that we read in Allen on. And... uh, This is a topic that is kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, uh, I'm now dealing with my third generation of alcoholism. So by now, thanks to Al-Anon and the grace of God, I better understand the importance of attitude uh, and the role it can play in recovery. Um, But let's kind of go back to... uh, my pre allen on days, and uh, this was probably about uh, 17 or 18 years ago, and uh, I'm going to quote a few sentences from uh, How allen on Works, uh, which described me and my situation. And How allen on Works says, We who have been affected by someone else's drinking find ourselves inexplicably haunted by insecurity, fear, guilt, obsession with others, and an overwhelming need to control every person and situation we encounter. Even those of us that can identify the problem as active alcoholism probably have no idea what to do about it. We only know that we've tried a lot of things that didn't work. 
and uh, I can personally attest to uh, uh, every statement there. And I can tell you when I first came to Al-Anon, I found myself in those circumstances. And my first thought was not, how can I change my attitude? <laughs> my concern was dealing with my anger and my frustration over someone else's drinking and behavior. At that time, the alcoholic in my life was my wife. And my approach uh, to this problem was to use logic. Uh, <laughs> and my original thought was, well, if I just explain to her how her drinking is uh, hurting her health and the family, uh, that would, uh, you know, maybe cause her to change. Uh, but uh, to my surprise, and probably not to yours, uh, this wasn't successful. <laughs> and when I uh, saw this wasn't working, I thought, well, maybe I just haven't explained this the right way. Uh, maybe, maybe I haven't chosen the right words that she can truly understand. Uh, so after several attempts uh, uh, and similar uh, results, uh, the anger and frustration that set in. This was kind of my introduction to that uh, definition of insanity that's talked about in Courage to Change, of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And uh, I think I was uh, a slow runner in this way. Uh, that uh, because of uh, dealing with alcoholism this way, uh, this fueled my anger and frustration. And what I needed was not anger and frustration. Uh, that needed to be transformed into understanding and compassion. And when I came to al uh I can probably say the closest thing I had to a positive attitude was my denial and being able to say, everything's fine. Uh, but as you well know, minimizing the uh, active alcoholism does not make the problems go away. And I want to thank my Al-Anon family for their patience uh, with me as I broke through my denial. Uh, it was kind of then that... Uh, uh, Alan uh, proved to really be a great help to me. And one of the early lessons I learned was on gratitude. Uh, now I think I had gratitude before I came to Alan on but it was more what I would describe as passive gratitude. Uh, certainly around Thanksgiving I would be able to sit back and know that I had a lot of good things in my life and that uh, in, was blessed in many ways. But then I'd always have the subconscious feeling that, you know, there were a few ways that I wasn't so blessed. And one of them was living with active alcoholism. But uh, this uh, tool of uh, using gratitude uh, in dealings with my alcoholic and my family uh, did show results, and uh, it was kind of thanks to you that uh, I can see what a powerful tool this could be. And uh, I think gratitude was probably a primary force in uh, changing my attitude. And too often in my early Al-Anon days when things would go wrong, uh, I'd turn to things like self-pity and blame. Uh, today, when things don't go my way, uh, at least part of the time I can look and say, what lesson is my higher power trying to teach me in this difficulty? Uh, but I can't always do that, but I do try. Uh, one more story about gratitude. And uh, I was listening one night uh, when a member shared her story. 
and she talked about being grateful for having married an alcoholic. And uh, I was early enough in the program that I said, well, that's never going to be me. But uh, at, at least at least that seed was planted that, uh, you know, I knew I had a goal that even if I got partway there, I thought maybe I can feel better about myself. And uh, I think this is one of the ways that uh, uh, we learn in Al-Anon is we watch the attitudes of others. And uh, I think that was a big help to me because I saw people that were in far worse circumstances than what I was, and yet they were able to keep a good attitude. They were able to be happy. And uh, I think uh, that's important. And uh, I know that uh, uh, that's one of the true gifts of Al-Anon is to be able to be around people that uh, truly have this act of gratitude. But at the same time, that uh, presents the challenges. Uh, I need to always be kind of asking uh, what attitude am I showing others in the program. And a lot of my pre al on life was uh, based on uh, the if-onlys. You know, if only she would stop drinking, if only they would support themselves without my help. Uh, <laughs> but changing our attitudes uh, uh, makes these if-only kind of a secondary factor in our happiness. Another issue I had was an attitude was was knowing with certainty future outcomes based on limited information. And for the most part, this would relate to something my wife was doing or not doing that I had figured out would have some range of bad outcomes. Uh, now, there's uh, uh, a good story called The Fable of the White Horse, uh, that kind of teaches uh, that nothing is necessarily good or bad. Now, I won't share that story with you, but uh, if you go out on the Internet and Google Fable, Fable of the White Horse, you can find it. And for me, I found that sometimes accepting something for what it is and not judging whether it's a curse or a blessing can be a powerful way of living one day at a time. And another cor corollary to this was giving up my need to understand the whys of alcoholism. When I was able to give up having to understand everything, my attitude improved. And this was another one of the gifts I received from Al-Anon. And uh, sometimes I find that uh, people and things just are what they are, and there's no amount of intellectual searching that will provide the answers I'm looking for. So letting go helps my attitude. And lastly, I want to talk about probably what I found to be one of the most effective tools for changing my attitude towards problem people. This tool is being able to pray for people we resent. And... Uh, Someone brought up this concept at a meeting uh, I was attending early in my program. And at that time, uh, I had a lot more opportunity to apply this concept. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was a little skeptical when uh, I first heard about it. Uh, um, as I was, you know, kind of many of the spiritual tools and or program tools and spiritual concepts I was learning. Uh, now, I could think of praying to God to get this person out of my life or something similar, similarly self-will directed. Uh, but praying for people we resent. So I decided to put this to the test. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, my granddaughter and her boyfriend and their two-year-old daughter uh, 
uh, moved back into our house uh, after uh, uh, they had been away for a while. No, I wish there were a fable out on the internet that uh, <laughs> you could read about having adult children and grandchildren move into your house. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, the circumstances for this was uh, they wanted to stay about a month or six weeks. Uh, the boyfriend was between jobs, so uh, as soon as he found work, uh, uh, they would be they would have money and be able to move out, and uh, everything would return to normal. Well. <laughs> As you know how these situations tend to work out, <laughs> we're moving along about month three or month four, and uh, my resentments are going from uh, uh, just thoughts to now being verbalized. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I would uh, talk about them when they weren't present uh, with comments such as, uh, uh, where are the aliens, or uh, what are the aliens up to? And uh, uh, I think some family members kind of identified this maybe as not being too healthy. Uh, and uh, even my wife said, well, you know, you probably shouldn't talk that way about them. And uh, my response was, well, if you go to the dictionary and look up the definition of alien, and you tell me that it doesn't apply, then I'll retract it. <laughs> but it was long about this time that uh, I said, uh, well, maybe I should start praying for these people I resent. And I did that. Now, this doesn't change overnight, but... I think in the period of probably about uh, three to four weeks, I found that uh, living with those people in my house became a lot more pleasant. You know, I was able to treat them at least with some element of love and respect. Uh, I could call them by their name even when they weren't there. Uh, uh, and I think that... Uh, this was uh, a good application that I found worked really well. Uh, uh, fortunately, that situation did eventually resolve itself, and uh, they were able to move out, and we were on relatively good terms when this happened. So uh, I think that was uh, certainly a valuable lesson to me in uh, uh, how praying for those we resent can change our attitudes. And then I had another uh, uh, circumstance. Uh, I think uh, I was probably four to five years into the program. Uh, I had uh, spent a weekend away, uh, kind of I'll call it a recovery weekend. And uh, when I uh, came home, I was feeling pretty good. And I kind of thought back of... Uh, where I was then versus where I was when I first came in the program. And I looked around pretty at, at my external circumstances. Uh, my wife's alcoholism had progressed. Uh, things weren't as good in my job. Uh, several other things. Nothing on the outside was better at that time than uh, five years before. But yet, I felt better about it. And to me, that's kind of how this program works and uh, changed attitudes can aid recovery. And I want to share just uh, one final thought that uh, uh, comes from an article on our forum uh, that I think I read about six months ago. And I don't remember the full uh, context of the article, but uh, in the middle of it, uh, it kind of offered these words of wisdom, which uh, I think uh, describe uh, uh, changed attitudes, can aid recovery. And it said, when we change the way we look at things, sometimes the things we look at change. And I want to thank you for your attention today.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.